Hello, folks. We are here again, carrying on with World War II TV's Leadership Week, and we are looking at the uh, enemy side today, depending on your point of view, but who is not an enemy of the Third Reich and the SS? They are the baddies, and we, I think we can say that quite legitimately. So we are talking about SS leadership in World War II, and my guest, it's amazing how long it's actually taken to get him on a guest, as a proper guest, a solo guest. Did a couple of our film discussions, panel discussions months and months ago, but it just seems to have taken ages to actually put him on his own show. So Dr. Philip Blood is joining me from Aachen in Germany. Um, good evening, Phil. How are you doing? Hi, Woody. Hi, everybody. Great to see you. I've been looking forward to this for ages. Good. Well, we're looking forward to hear from you because you know, this theme is about leadership this week. And mm. as I said at the end of yesterday's show, you can be a good leader and a terrible person and you can be a good person and a terrible leader. Those are That is the situation we have in World War II. Some of the very well-meaning allied people were, were perhaps out of their depth, but they were good people. And on the other side, you have people like Heydrich, who's a, a very efficient at what he does, but an absolutely despicable human being. And it's that's that what's what makes it interesting and worthy of discussion. And you know, we're we're never going to during this show um do anything but condone what the SS stood for, but there's yeah. this we can examine them. We can examine how the organization functioned, how it was structured, how you rose within it, and and some of the people that were there. So um, how did you, you know, I mean, you're living in Germany. What what kind of, I'm not going to say what drew you to the SS, but your your study of these leaders, it's been a part of your life for a long time. Is it, What is it you're trying to find out when you study them? Um, I suppose it goes back to family saying how they'd experienced the war, the Second World War, the, the, the horrors of it. And I just wanted to under, better understand who the people had caused this pain and anguish. And and that was where my idea to go down the route that I have gone uh, stemmed from. It was really just to ask the question, who are these people and why had they caused such horror? And I think that's a perfect response. It's that fascination we have with the serial killers. It's the fascination we have. we've got getting in the minds of why, why some of these people do such despicable things and how it becomes normal because as we'll find out during your powerpoint presentation your ss kind of one runs like a at some point like an, like an efficient company it's a it's a it's producing evil it's producing death it's it's running like a like a well-oiled say business it's it, the business of killing uh because it that's how the ss grows to be but well you've prepared an absolutely stunning PowerPoint presentation. Um, you'll enjoy this, folks. So I'm going to hand over to Phil and let him explain things. And then if we have some questions coming in, I will put them to Phil at various points. Some of them I might leave till later in the show to try and not interrupt the flow too much. We'll see how it goes. But um, over to you, Phil. Well, I thought I'd start with um, essential questions to the theme of the program, which is, you know, hit. Um, the SS leadership in Hitler's war. And the three questions I chose um, were for specific reasons. And the, one of those reasons was um, my PhD research examined the idea of security warfare, which was something that I created as a, a platform to understand the way Germany had used security to occupy and colonize, or later on the Nazis, um, imposed Lebensraum. Uh, and so it was really a question of how security could be used as a war weapon uh, and the impact of security and of course its consequences. And the ramifications of using uh, security as a war aim in itself always has um, ethnic cleansing, um, serious atrocities, genocide and it, you can see it tipping into Holocaust because it's related ideologically and organi orga organizationally. Um, the other thing is, um, to a certain extent, a lot of what I've used here comes from my own work experience. Before I became a historian, I um, studied in management science and had also um, worked with some senior companies and had understood how certain aspects of operational research and systems had affected companies and I'd seen how that had worked. And I started to use some of that experience in my research. And 
And actually, I was encouraged at the time by Richard Holmes when I started my PhD with him, because he was fascinated how we could start looking at organizations like the SS from a clear, concise, unemotional uh, process of analysis. Um, and then we're in the place where we are today, and I've, I've used some of the key words there, uh, politics of violence. I'm, I'm actually in a place which is not any longer so much the Holocaust or genocide, but an area where there's violence taking place within the Nazi regime um, that really doesn't fall under directly under the Holocaust, doesn't fall under genocide. Um, it's a confusion of, of issues, which in some cases are war crimes and sometimes are just evil doing, if you like. I mean, I don't particularly like using evil doing, but there is an element of let's cause extreme uh, misery, pain, and lead to death through hunger, which is not really easily defined as a as a war crime as such. So we're now, I think myself and many other scholars are using this idea of this notion of politics of violence. So if we go to slide two, um, following on from the questions, I thought it was a good idea to look at the SS mission because all organizations, old, present, future, are always have a mission statement. That's common to all organizations. The Army, British Army has its mission statement. The SS mission statement was quite, quite precise. Uh, their primary function was to secure Hitler, the Nazi regime, and the, and the Nazi party. Uh, it was to establish a police state, an SS police state, but also to enforce a national security ethos. And this dips back to what I was saying about security warfare in the idea that national security has an element that takes it into an aggressive action against Poland or some other country. Um, of course, with the Nazis, you cannot move away from the ideological issue of the eradication of racial enemies. Uh, and we'll discuss that later and of course now fundamental to the German military mindset has always been the protection of institutional integrity and cohesion and that is take so that concept of a paramilitary organization protecting itself maintaining its integrity and cohesion both in war and in peace is a powerful motive in SS behavior so if we go to the third slide now, you, <laughs> you were talking about my past. Well, the first, funny enough, the first time I actually read anything to do with the SS was in 1972, which was Heinz Turner's book. I'll come back to that in a second. But if you look at the trajectory of, of historiography from that period, the, the three things that come out of this, one is that Himmler, usually regarded as the chicken farmer who's somewhat organizationally bent with crazy ideas who leads the SS down the narrow path of Holocaust and genocide. You have the social order of the SS. So here's a group picture with all the, some of the leading figures and that these guys are somehow a clique, a social clique, which is of a political form that some of them are working class, large majority of them are middle class, well educated, and a few are upper class, and they they don't all fall into uh, positions of authority for, for whatever reason. They either fail to perform or anyway. So what you end up with is an organizational chart, which looks like this, and it, we don't need the detail, but the point is here, you're just looking at the boxes. And you can see the sheer volume of activities that the SS is working on. But there's so much going on, it's very difficult to put within a single organizational chart. And I think we'll just move on to the next one. Uh, and you can see here, this is 1967. This is um, Heinz Hörner, the German scholar who tried to model this organization 
into a coherent chart. And even that's wrong. He, and, and in 1944, he's still missing an awful lot. So mm -hmm. you, you can see the constraints of trying to understand this organization when it's, it's so big and amorphous. So if we go on to the next mate, um, slide. So I've taken Heinz Herner's diagram and I've cut it in two and pointed to the red, which is the units that we understand, the Waffen SS, the SS Commando, because I think those are um, more interesting perhaps to many of the viewers. And I'm going to introduce the guys in the green, which is the order police or the ordnance polizei. And, and these are uh, not often understood in the German war effort. So those are the two, if you like, the two main groups of this organization. So if we, we just move on to the next slide. Now, <laughs> because of the size of the organization, I'm having to put some caveats in. And I don't particularly like this because all of these things should be covered in what I'm about to speak about, but it is just physically impossible. For example, if you were to look at the SS and the State Hunting Code and Heritage, you can actually see a linkage between the, the methods of reconstructing animals that were once extinct by Lutz Heck, using those heritage studies to create supermen of SS officers and SS soldiers. Mm. So you have a breed, <laughs> you have a stock breeding story, which is quite bizarre to think about. But if you listen to many of those who 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 were who um, participated in it, the marriage ceremonies, the having sex in cemeteries, and all of this stuff, I actually took it seriously. Now, for me, that's irrelevant to what we're going to discuss, which is about the SS in leadership. So. I've, I've literally had to cut these out, but I have, I would like to point out, and I'm probably doing this quite a bit along the way, is there's a very good book on this subject of the Reich Sicherheitsdienst, the, the SD officers. And Michael, Professor Mike, Michael Wilt, he uses a lot of this evidence in his book and explains about the SS leadership. Okay, so if we move on. Now, <laughs> We're going to talk about the Matrix organization, which I'm sure is going to sound crazy in a study of the SS in the Second World War. Okay. If you look at organizational theory in the traditional form, you have boxes. So there's the pay office, there is the frontline units, there is the regiments, there's the battalions, the artillery, and all the rest of it. But the SS don't work like that. So when you try and apply those boxes, you have the problems that Heinz Herner's having. So if we for a second imagine that the general manager in this picture is Heinrich Himmler and the, and the people in the green underneath are his, line, his senior line directors, you can then see on the, on the to me it's my left side, the uh, project one, two and three, the project managers, they are the line officers in the field, and then you can see the, the manpower filling the boxes. And they will apply an, a senior officer to build a project team to deal with a project. Now, if you look at any of the SS operations from a leadership perspective, this is what they're doing all the time. So you have the SS Totenkopf Verbander, which has a director, Theodore Ecker, and then he has his line officers, and then all of his camps are spread out as different projects with project teams. So you have Dachau, Auschwitz, and so forth. And and the same happens in the Waffen SS, and you can apply that model. So I'm not saying that every no, SS organization is this way. What I'm saying is that this matrix organization is a better way to comprehend how Himmler is running his organization. Just going to interrupt you for a second, Phil, sure. because I just, I just am. Um, David uh, um, O'Keefe asking, would it be fair enough to liken it to an organized crime ring? Yeah, actually, it's quite a good question. 
in the sense that you would think that you're dealing with a kind of a mafia association. But I have my reservations. I have a great many reservations with that because criminal gangs, yes, they're cutthroats and they're killing each other and they're fighting with each other and there's rivalries. But I'm talking to you about an organization which is in government and it's there for everybody to see and there are rules and laws. And even the SS abide by national laws. So mm. to actually call it a criminal organization, I have my res I can understand why you would, because at certain times within the history of the SS, they do actually kill each other. So there are there there is that process there, but I think we have to stay within the concepts of governmental institution, or the rise towards governmental institution, mm -hmm. having once been a political street fighting band, to then becoming. Um, a major function within the SS uh, within the Nazi state. So, can we move on? Or is yep. that okay? Right. Now, to make the matrix organization work correctly, you have to have dynamics like communications and feedback loops, and what what we call, I suppose, cybernetic models, where where information on the battlefield is is fed back through a process and brought back to Himmler through various forms. And what you have, if you can imagine on, on the diagram on the left, is how information moves from, from the big wobbly squabbly thing on the to my left uh, through various functions. So there's been fighting there, the, the troops have been fighting, then the record comes back through the boxes, and then it works its way up through the SS hierarchy. And then it's fed back down in the way of experience and uh, how we internalize what we've done, if you like. Mm. So what you're seeing within the SS up, and up from the period, almost from the moment when Himmler takes control in the 1920, late 1920s, to the period when, when they become a police state, he's actually made them into a learning organization and they're giving themselves feedback all the time. And that is helping them function. So they have high functionality, high efficiency, but I think one factor in business that we always um, overlook is highly effective. They really do hit their targets. So if we can move on to the next one. So of course, <laughs> of course, you can't really ignore ideology, even in an organizational context like the SS, and especially not with the SS, when we're looking at its early days. And what you can see here in this diagram is a chart of, if you like, the loves and hates of the SS organization. It's really a reflection of what um, goes through the Nazi mindset in terms of neighborliness, hatreds, uh, genocide, uh, honorable comradeship. And this diagram was produced by Bernd Wegner in about 1982. And the, if, you, if you imagine there's a cross, the lower half are the hatreds and the upper half are the, um, the honorable aspects of German society. So things like uh, Germanic, the Germanic people, they're obviously the target for the SS to secure, whereas below the Jews are a target for eradication. And that, what you're actually mapping there is a mindset which is in every SS, Nazi, and to a certain extent, and we have to say this, many of the German people of the time. This, is, this isn't uncommon thinking. We're, we're living in a time where racialism is part of everyday life. And if, you know, in, in this area where I am in Arkham, we have people who, to a certain extent, um, actually went against the Nazis. So in 1932, they were, how can you put it, 80% um, anti-Nazi. Mm -hmm. Now, come a few years later and all of that attitude has changed and, and you think why 
and even they even they even parade in 1938 to save the catholic church against national socialism and say we can be catholics and also we can support the fuhrer <laughs> and then only a few months later they're they're smashing the synagogue and smashing the streets so the complexity of ideology in the nazi state is very very difficult to pin down and say well at this time they're going to be that and this time they're going to be that but one thing's certain with an ss man this isn't any different this this is how they think so for the mindset of the ss as we were talking about in the previous learning curve what's creating their decisions is this so if we could move on to the next one so in in the days of pre-television god i'm going to sound like grande so in the days of pre-television and no films and no smartphones and all of that good stuff there's two things that you there's there are only two ways you can get your message across one is the radio and the other is the speech and what himmler does and here he is in suitably sterile um rooms and you can see i mean those pictures of how sterile those areas are is a message anyway you know we're we're professional vermin killers and we will kill anything not just races but we will make everything clean and we will make you secure and he's presenting that message to the german people and he says it again and again and again so what you what you what you actually have is this reinforcement concept within himmler's thinking and i've called it the ss word salad um he's using constantly the same words over and over and over again honor loyalty substance action warriors blah and a lot of people get fed up with himmler's speeches they think well pff, you know it's the same old thing all of the time but if you look at say 1943 he said the same speech 10 times that's pretty dynamic that's really hammering home the message and he says the same things to all aspects of society so he's he's talking one minute to the german generals he's talking next minute to the ss leaders next minute he's talking to the people next minute and and on and on and on and so forth so he's really smashing a message we think of Joseph Goebbels being this highly intensified propagandist, but Himmler, wow, I mean, Himmler on his own is really kicking a message out there and people follow him. And this idea that Himmler's hated, I think we have to think again about that because he's got an awful lot of followers. So if we can move on. Now, I'm sorry about this. I'm going to have to take a slug because it's a bit warm here. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, no worries so this might appear complicated in the way because <laughs> there's no easy way to describe this but if you like there's parallel philosophies and cultures taking place at the same time and they're all to do with the great war so if you look at the picture on the on the right my right which is german soldiers in stone coming out of the ground in dusseldorf that's an embodiment of the concept of the Vactam Rhine. Right? So those soldiers are coming out. If, where I've taken the photograph, behind me is the Rhine. So they're coming out to protect the Rhine and fight for, for, for Germany's survival. So that is symbolic of what's happening in Germany. You've got thousands and thousands of people writing books, giving memoirs, stories, biographies of von Richthofen, and all of, the, all of this stuff just literally pours out of the second uh, uh, of the first world war plus you've got all the veterans on the street and the wounded and the disaffected like hermann goering and himmler and all of these people at the same time there's a generation of of young men and himmler's one of them who missed the war now what himmler does is he participates and you can see him standing there with the right flag the imperial flag in 19, uh, 1923 but he went to military training in 19, 1918 he missed the war but he took part in the Freikorps battles and he took part in the battle of munich um, 
And so all of that period, 1919 to 1923, becomes an extension of the struggle for Germany, but the, stroke, the extension of the First World War. As a consequence, they start using the term Frontkämpfer and Outerkämpfer, so old soldier, front fighter, and they get mixed into this. And actually, if you look at Himmler's records, you will find evidence of him calling himself an old soldier and a front camper, which of course he wasn't, but that never stops the SS with their, with their record keeping. So I know it's been a bit complex. We've gone through matrix organization. We've gone through learning curves. We've gone through culturalization. We've gone through aesthetic philosophy and all the rest of it. You can't, you can't take this stuff away from the SS because this is what the SS is about. This is its, this is, if you like, the body politic of the SS, the real substance that gives it the power. So if we just move on. Now, as I've said before, Himmler's quite intelligent. And, and, and I don't say that too loosely because there's an awful lot of the Nazis aren't. And so you've got this one very intelligent person surrounded by a load of idiots. And what he does is he learns his trade from past masters and his primary past master in war in the in the idea and the notions of war is surprisingly Ludendorff and even I hadn't sussed how far Himmler had gone with going down the road of supporting and believing in what uh, Eric, Eric Ludendorff had done and I put the book here, Jay Lockenauer's Dragon Slayer, because it really is a, a fantastic piece of work who's really shown me a different view of, of uh, Ludendorff, but how his work, Der Totale Krieg, comes into Himmler's thinking. Now, this might sound strange, but Ludendorff became very anti-Clausewitz. Now, if you, if you think of Clausewitz that, you know, war is an extension of politics by other means. If you go against that and you have the concepts of the total war and war for war's sake and fighting for the sake of fighting, an entire securitization of your of your state in a war zone and, and the extension of that into occupation and, and security zones and blah, then where does that come from? And it comes from Ludendorff. So Himmler, he's not actually going into military academies. He's forming his own opinion of what future war will look like. And because of his relationship with Hitler and the front and the actual men who fought in the First World War, he's got in his learning curve scenario, he's got information coming in from the First World War generation, but he's sifting it out and saying, these are my ideas. This is the kind of war that I'm going to fight. And so this is, this is very important how he builds this up because he's still learning this stuff into the 1930s. You know, this isn't just straight from his school days when he was fascinated with what was going on at, on at the front. This is actually continuing into, his thir into the 30s. So if we could go to the next. So this is, this is how can I put it? This is the moment when everything that happened before is now wiped away. And it's a very, conf it's a very confusing period because the SS have come into, into power. Hindenburg has handed power to Hitler and the, and, the, and the German elites have given the Nazis power. What you can't see down, further down the road is that some of those some of those offices like the German police have literally seen the German police president leave as he did in Aachen and the Nazi come in. And in this chaotic period, right the way up until 1934, you have the SR, the Sturmabteilung, Hitler's first uh, street fighters, if you like, have really been pushing and then once they get into power, they start pushing in a different way. They, they want to, it's alleged, there is evidence for it, that Ernst Röhm is going to raise a German army. 
and he's going to use the SIR to replace the army. Now, here's a very interesting situation. Rome is the, is the chief above Himmler, who's peering over in his glasses, and Kurt de Leuger to the left is, him, is Goering's senior Prussian police officer, police general. So, in a sense, Rome is their boss. Now, in 1934, they kill Rome and, the, and several parts of the leadership. But, as you see from the little quote that I put there from Himmler, he's saying that we can't talk about this. Now, the fascinating thing, <laughs> the fascinating thing about the SS old boys is this is the one aspect of their life that they do not talk about and have never talked about. Now, to me, it's a, I think there's a deep disgrace there which has been dressed up as something honourable that you've actually killed your bosses, you've killed your comrades, and you killed your friends. And you've actually institutionalised killing within the Nazi cadres. So for the first time, that they've actually conducted institutionalized killing. Now, okay, it's, there's rivals, rivalries involved. There's Goering on the one side who wants his share of that stormtroop manpower, and you've got Himmler who wants to replace Rome and, and, and do his thing. But, but, what have you done to the mindset of the SS? It, you suddenly radicalize them and they, and they get away with it. Now, what actually happens in 1936, Julius Schreck, who is the guy above Rome, Schreck had founded the SS in 1925 as a small bodyguard for Hitler. Now, there was some scandal and he was eventually replaced, and, but he did, be, he did remain as Hitler's chauffeur. Now, in 1936, he died. I think he had an embolism. I, I honestly can't remember. But the point is, his funeral in SS documentation was massive. And if you look there, you see him. I'm sorry, I couldn't get any better picture because uh, the, the, the National Archives disc that I copied it from is a, bit, is a bit rough and grainy. But what you see there is Hitler and all the SS chiefs and leaders putting together a ceremony. But which ceremony? For Julius Schreck or for the fact that they'd killed Rome two years before and they can't talk about it? My opinion is this is a statement of this is where we're going. This isn't, this isn't Julius Schreck. Who is he? You know, they didn't do this for Horst Vessel. So why are they doing it for Schreck? And I think it's, it's a commemoration of what they've done to Rome and a statement of how they're going to go forward as a deaf cult. Is this like that that thing where I'm being maybe a bit trivial, where the serial killer, before he actually goes on the spree, kind of leaves trinkets or something or leaves that message? It's kind of yeah, there's a bring there's a moment when it could stop, but there's a moment that once you cross that line, you can't go back again. Is that kind of what you're saying? They've stepped over the threshold. There's no mm. going back now. Mm. The only way this is going to stop is if they don't go to war. And mm. that isn't going to happen. Mm. So I, I, I identified this. This, this, is a, a, this is a really serious point in the history of the SS, which many people overlook. I mean, I remember talking to Major General Reynolds, who wrote a book on the SS cause and what have you. And I met him in Royal United Services Institute, and he said this is all irrelevant. And I, I just couldn't understand how you could miss that point. Yeah. So, shall we, shall we move on? So, Himmler and Goering form up an SS police state, and it's often regarded that Himmler is taking stuff off Goering. What's actually happening is that they're changing the functions of the state. So Goering, in his pale blue 
Luftwaffe uniform, is already becoming a chief of a very large arm of German armed forces. Now, we know that they're, they're, they're buried under the Wehrmacht, but actually the Luftwaffe, I can assure you now, is a very independent organization, and it's running a very different style of organization to the army. So they swap manpower, and we do know that the police regiment that went to Hermann Goering's Luftwaffe became the Hermann Goering Panzer Division. So in, all of that is fairly well known. What's less well known is that Goering passes Kurt de Leuger, who you see in the bottom picture, who was his Prussian police chief, who now becomes chief of the Ordnungspolizei. Now, it's not really important, but if you're looking at the mindset that's driving Kurt de Leuger, you look at the organizational diagram. That is traditional military style boxes. Okay. And you can see he's placed himself. If you look at the second one down, he's placed himself directly from the top under Heinrich Himmler. And then he said, all of these people are all under my control and they're all little boxes. Now, that's not how Himmler thinks, because we know that's not how he thinks, because we've seen how he works with his matrix concept. So de Leuga has brought in the, the First World War style because he is a, a wounded veteran from the, from the Great War. I believe he was a senior unteroffizier. And his authority is that of, in a sense, the training man of the German police. And what he does is start setting them into a militarization program. So if we move on. So I've got you now to 1938. So what we've actually got to with the SS as an institution are these four guys. There's Reinhard Heydrich, there's Heinrich Himmler, there's Kurt de Leuger and Karl Wolf. And it, it's interesting that you... <laughs> We get these little sound bites by Nazis everywhere along. And, and Hitler's one is a few months ago, a black shadow rose over the movement. But, you know, you look at that and you think, well, actually, yes, there was, but I'm not sure he, he realized what that black shadow was actually doing. Yeah. <laughs> it was actually attacking. It's about to attack its own. And he can't see that. Nobody can. But we'll come to that next so if we go to the next stage so we're going to have to go down a few little avenues here because if you remember the matrix as a general manager and then there's the the senior managers running along and these senior managers have a, a very important role and probably the most important is Gottlob Berger and what he what he is is a former um, soldier from the First World War, and you can see all his medals on the left side. I, I put the picture there to show that he's got his Iron Cross and all the rest of it. He's showing his Great War credentials, but he was very seriously wounded. So he would not, as, as far as I understand it, and I can only go by his personnel files, he could not be recruited into the German army. He might serve in a function here and there, but he could not go back because his wounds were so serious. Now, what Himmler has done is what he does. He can't do this job, so he scoops up experience to do the job for him. And that's where you see this concept of matrix working because what, what there is here is not so much a transfer of power, but a transfer of function. Himmler can't do it, so he's got a guy to come in. And very quickly, within a short space of time, even in the 30s, this guy has put together the Allgemeine SS, the SS Totenkopfverband, the Grenzschutzpolizei, which is nearly always forgotten about, but works very closely with the Gestapo, especially during the, the Reichskristallnacht when they um, are robbing the, the synagogues before the burning takes place, and then, of course, later the Waffen SS. Now, the story about Gottlob Berger, and I've put it there, is he was a big supporter. Now, this is where, if we were to go back to the Mafia question, this is where the Mafia concept works, because Berger's, let's say, protege was a man called Oscar Dillavanger, 
And Delavanger had been a very brave and outstanding soldier in the First World War, but was, well, to say he was strange um, is perhaps an understatement. I mean, he was involved in all kinds of criminal activities. Uh, there's a case of rape against him. And yet at the same time, he's going to university and getting a doctorate in whatever, some university. And what was interesting, <laughs> what was interesting was the, the author of the book, The Cruel Hunters, uh, French McLean, I actually met in the Pentagon. So we're in, <laughs> in America sitting down having a coffee uh, with a, an, a great friend of mine, um, Joe White, uh, who sadly now passed. But with the three of us were sat there and you would have thought, well, he's just written a book about The Cruel Hunters. I'm finishing my PhD on on um, Bandon McCamphorn. And we would be talking about Oscar Dillavanger. No, we actually spoke for almost two hours about Gottlob Berger and why he is the he is the kind of grey eminence behind the SS throne, and that that power there is huge, and it doesn't show in the stories. So when we see books about Sepp Dietrich's Waffen SS and its troops doing this, that, and the other, the man behind it is Gottlob Berger. Now, he's the man who's supplying the troops. So if we go on to the next one. Now, the SS expansion is so rapid in the 30s, there are shortages. And, the, and consequently, the, you, you can see what those shortages are going to be before you even get there. And it's all about well-trained officers and NCOs. And this becomes the most critical thing in all of the all of the armed forces throughout the whole of the period of the war. There's never enough NCOs anywhere, and there's never ever enough officers. Now, Hans Jutner was another of these highly decorated, high performing officers from the First World War. But his unusual past is he's a well traveled man. He's actually been to places like Mesopotamia, he's been to Turkey, he's been to Palestine, and, and so forth. And that gives him an advantage over the other Germans who haven't traveled because obviously the younger kids, they were, or the younger men, they, they were unable to travel during the First World War. And in the 20s, many of them were unable to travel because there's literally no money with, you know, the economic crisis and, and the, the great crash and what have you. So his experience of living and working in foreign countries also helps him identify good quality trainees to go in either the Junkerschule or the medical services. Now, there's a lot of talk about the SS never really being trained in, you know, the Waffen SS never really being trained in a political sense. They go straight to the battlefield. Well, you know, that's all touch. So if you start, if you looked at that diagram from the base, what you see is at the base is a ladder and you've got to get to the top. So what you're actually doing is going for a whole series of processes, such as um, the Wehrmacht and um, serving in the Arbeitsdienst, but also doing SS work, SA work, um, Nazi associations, Winterhilfer. I mean, there's just loads of them. But unless you've gone up the ladder and crossed those hurdles, you're never going to reach the top. And what Jutner is doing is pushing it. He's pushing them through. And you see that instead of going in the wartime, they close down the, the, the political schools at the top and they push them into the younger schools. So they go through this rapid program, which is then condensed. So if you were, if you were, um, if you were listening in the 80s to, to this guy, who is um, Schultz Cossens, and I'll show you a picture of him. I, I couldn't get it in because I only found the book after I'd sent you the thing. And Schultz Coulson has, has, has managed to sell the story that the Junkerschule are these places of great honour and no naughtiness. We, we, we don't do race here. We don't do that here. Well, it's just rubbish. It's, uh, it's just all false. And people actually still believe it. So what what you actually see is... 
Han Jutner taking all of that Nazi stuff from the 1920 from the 1920s and 30s and compacting it into the the Junker Schulen. So the Junker Schulen are training people like uh, Wittmann, who is a tank commander, who maybe people who ask questions about it later. Um, there's historians who say, well, he was never a Nazi. I mean, are you kidding me? The guy is absolutely overloaded with SS Nazi qualifications and memberships and Totenkopf ring uh, and blah, blah, and it goes on forever. You know? So this, this is where all the action is. This is where the, the, the future SS leadership is coming from, and it's coming from this guy. And in 1942, he's done such a great job. He gets the German cross in silver as a reward purely for training officers and NCOs. Yeah. So we move on. Now, to make the learning organization function, you, you don't have everywhere, you don't have telephones. Okay, telephones make the, 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 the great point of making life simple. You can pick up the phone, you can talk to Auschwitz, and you can say, right, we're going to kill however many people today in Auschwitz. You don't want to do that in terms of great long surveys and studies and project assessments. And so what you have are liaison officers and they're run from uh, Carl Wolf's personnel staff. And if you looked at the lower picture with the man facing directly, that's Carl Wolf. He's, he's standing between Hermann Fagerlein, who's the chief of the SS cavalry and Heinrich Himmler and to his left, is Eric fonden Baxalevsky. Now, if you go above, you'll see Heinrich Himmler and, of course, Jochen Piper. And so, you know, there's another living story about Jochen Piper to the right, serving as a, as a, a liaison officer to Himmler, going around, you know, these horrible sites, the, the concentration camps, the extermination camps. But what these liaison officers are doing is assessing project management and making sure targets are being hit and 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 conducting field and camp inspections and also doing surveys and assessments and also time and motion time and motion is so important because in all of himmler's ideas about how you make things work he's actually setting hard tasks over short periods so he's actually doing this industrial stuff of time and motion, which, you know, is Taylorism and Ford and all of that, which has been brought into the SS mindset. And Carl Wolf is behind that. Now, we all seen Carl Wolf complaining like hell during the World at War series that he didn't know what the hell was going on. And when he did, he was shocked and horrified. Well, you know, well, load of old tosh that is. So if we can move on to the next one. So we get to 1940. I hope people aren't bored now. <laughs> so we get to... Believe me, my, so, Phil, they are absolutely spellbound by this. And it, I, I don't know whether I'm more scared by your constant kind of parallels with it being big business and time and motion or whether it's making it me, me love you and love this talk more. It's just, it's just absolutely, people are, people are tweeting about it, getting people to watch on. It's got good viewing figures. You just keep going, Phil. This is amazing. Okay. Well, that's very kind, and thank you, everybody. Uh, so I'm a little bit concerned because we haven't really got to the big war bit, but we're now going to have a bit of war, and this is 1940. So they've steamed through Poland, and they've steamed through um France and they've steamed through the Low Countries and everywhere else. And there's a huge meeting, and it and it's focused on the 9th of September. Now, most people don't know what Met's Day is, but it relates to the days when um, the Germ the Prussian German army defeated the French in the Franco-Prussian War in 1871, and it was always celebrated and, and marked as a day of respect, and that was known as Metz Day. So Hitler's bodyguard, which is Sepp Dietrich's here, and the full unit, goes to Metz, and there's a huge presentation in which Himmler 
gives a talk about the future and congratulates them because Hitler has allowed them to have Adolf Hitler on their cuff band. So at this moment, and I've got the, uh, there's a clipping at the top of, a, of an announcement. You can see there's only the Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler. There's the SS Polizei Division and there's the Allgemeine SS. You must be a volunteer to join these organizations. And by the way, that never changes. So anybody who tells you they were conscripted into the SS, hmm, really? So you, you, you have three organizations. And the question comes to, should we expand? OK, so we're, we're still in this leadership organizational issue, and we're in the matrix. And the question is, shall we take volunteers? Is this a good idea or not? And there is debate. And not everybody thinks it's a very good idea because you're, you're risk breaking the SS unity and elitism, which they've generated. I mean, I don't like the word elitism because it implies that they were something special. They're not really special. They're just walking around in uniforms which have an incredible amount of power behind them, which enables them to do things which is regarded, uh, you know, which is incredibly unpleasant. They are bullies, bullies in black uniforms. But what happens when you bring these foreign troops in is that you have different bonds and different ties. You have uncontrolled rivalries, and you, and you can see them, they suddenly develop. You've got Leon de Grel fighting with this bloke, and Arta Fleps in Yugoslavia won't allow any of these people in. They're all, they're all arguing. And of course, there's different ideological standards. So whereas you've got de Grel with his Catholic Rexist fascist coming in from Belgium, you've got the crazy nuttiness from Arta Fleps in the Balkans, and you've got the Danes coming down with their ideas. And what they're doing is they're actually changing the shape of the matrix and it's beginning it's not wobbling they're not wobbly yet but it's there it, it it's a, there's a period of uncomfort now for De set dietrich this is great i'm the commander of what's going to be a top division so blinker he's quite happy he doesn't see the bigger picture because he doesn't really care because he lives in berlin lichterfelder which is an area which has been dominated by the first SS Panzer Division or Leibstandarte people. All their families are there. It's like a colony. And they just live in this colony within Berlin, just like another lot lives in Wilmersdorf and another lot lives over in Reinickerdorf. So he, his whole perception of what he does is his, his little world. Berlin Lichterfelder, the battlefront, the battlefront, Lichterfelder. Maybe have a beer with Hitler, Hitler won't drink, but he'll have a, you know, whatever. So if we go to the next one, now, here are the questions. If you stay as a Schutzstaffel, which is a protection guard to the Führer, you can press the prestige, the promotion, propaganda, and the politics to a nice, cosy elite. But if you go to the Waffen SS, and you play with prestige, promotion, propaganda, and politics, you have very, very dangerous traits because your targets in war are different from being a bodyguard securing the Fuhrer and the gang. You're suddenly changing the entire emphasis of what, you, what you're about. Your raison d'etre as a, as a military organization suddenly changes. You've gone from security, short-minded, little space area to this big picture. And I'm not sure that the, there's capability within the, S, the Waffen SS organization to call, to, to, to cope with that change. So what you have here is, yes, they're talking about the future, which is this, you know, the idea of who we're going to be tomorrow is for us and all of that stuff. But there's nobody thinking about, hang on a minute, are we beginning to overreach? And that's why I put the red background, because this is this is a first danger signal. Everybody's happy. They've just won what they think is the war. Hitler has not decided on Russia yet, although it's in his mindset. They are pressing. They are pressing. And they're not sure. They think they've got a nice little future. 
um, setting up farms as militarized warriors in the east, in Poland and what have you. Maybe there is an indication that they're going to go to Russia, in which case they want to be out there getting their farms earlier than anybody else, these legionaries. But that hasn't yet been decided. So we're at the very, the, the, the very nudge point. So we're now on the next one. Now, what? <laughs> while they're doing the crazy stuff with the Waffen-SS, individuals are starting to emerge within the Waffen-SS who have, if you like, a form of self-actualization which is greater than what was the SS body. So, for example, and it's one of the few times that I'll refer to Reinhard Heydrichs in this talk, he puts on a Luftwaffe uniform, flies in a 109, gets his iron cross, but, but, he gets shot down over Russia and he forces a military unit to go and rescue him. Now, hang on a minute. Okay, he's a valuable guy. But what the hell's he doing in a fighter plane, flying over Russia, getting shot down? Yeah? So now we look at the, the guy in the middle is Theodore Ecker, and Ecker is in charge of the SS, SS Totenkopf unit. And it doesn't matter how much military training he gets, this guy is climb out your trench and run at the enemy. So he is actually destroying his own troops, and he's taking a great delight in having large casualty rates, which goes against the idea of having a small elite unit. And it goes against all the Prussian things, uh, but he needs his glory. He needs his iron, his Knight's Cross and his Iron Cross and all the rest of it. Then we come to Josef Mengele, and you think, well, he's gone through the SS system, and he's learned to be a combat doctor with, I think, the life standards, I always forget. And then suddenly he's gone into the camps and he started to do medical experiments, which are no good to man the beast. I mean, they do. Why? And for what purpose? And, the, and, and suddenly he's gone off and done this. Okay, there's, it's within the, the, the whole of the SS medical structure. But what benefit for the future of German military arms is sewing twins together in Auschwitz camps. I mean, it's just so, it, it's an obscenity which is being accepted within the SS mold. So again, it's not yet wobbled, it's not completely wobbled, but there's things happening which is making the matrix break down. And these are the symptoms. And in this case, I've used, um, you know, the, the book by Dixon, which was um, on the psychology of military incompetence. I think there could be more work done on the psychology of the SS and how these uh, individualism versus the mass, individualism dressed as initiative, these thoughts could actually be put into more research. I mean, it's not for me, I'm not a trained psychiatrist, but it does strike me that these traits of irrational behavior being accepted within the, within the SS body politic is just, ugh doesn't it doesn't fit the game plan and how they've convinced him that is well you know anyway so if we if we move on because i don't particularly like those guys so we <laughs> we get to kurt the lawyer and um a friend of mine mike miller who's um from axis military form forum um, provide <laughs> provided the lawyer with the flowers which i mean, I mean yeah they like to be seen in these situations. Now, what you don't know about uh, Kurt Deloitte is the fact that he uses all these Kantian tropes and sayings to, I don't know, discuss, to, to, to promote his idea that the, the, the German police are Hitler's green helpers. Yeah? His actual ambition is the police on the front in operations. And as you can see, they look like German soldiers. Okay. So if we go to the next slide. So 
what you get is the police are the backbone of the Holocaust by bullets. And the Holocaust by bullets is the period when they, when the, during the um, operations moving east in from 1941, the SS police conduct killing exercises and they're either within the Einsatzgruppe and supporting the killing actions of the senior, SS, uh, senior SD officers under Reinhard Heydrich's command or they're under the rear area commanders of people like uh, Friedrich, um, oh, I can't remember his name now, and another one is Baxilevsky. And these, these police units are set to killing and wiping out Jewish communities. And, and the process is uh, killing today for tomorrow's security. Well, that never comes because as soon as you've killed the Jews, then there's another enemy, and there's another enemy, and it's and and this is ideologically driven because the 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 the, the SS are pushing, pushing the eradication of areas, and what it leads to is wastelands. So, the German army is desperate for food and supplies and and what have you when it's fighting in the east, and the SS is making a wasteland of it. So now that now what's beginning to wobble is the is the battle plan. So one's running to one mission and another's running to another mission, and there's a huge gap developing between the join up of those two missions. And just to sh you know, one of the primary sources in all of the study of um, of this work is. Uh, Christopher Browning's Ordinary Men, and um, I'll put a copy of the book there, which, which was profoundly important to me in the 1990s when I first started to do serious research on Baxilevsky and for my PhD. So if we can move on to the next one. Now, Kurt de Leuger has the ambition that he wants to police Europe, and what you see in this sheet of paper is his actual doodlings of the number of people Within a state, so you've got the German state, Netherlands, the colonies, Russia. He's worked out the number of population. He's worked out the number of police it needs to police that population. And he's come up with a calculation. And what the two red boxes say basically is, I've got 189 or thereabouts, 189,000 policemen out in the east at, out on occupation or serious policing duties at the moment, but I need another 200 odd thousand to boost the figure. So we're in 1941, we've just stepped over one year from that September meeting and already the Leuger wants manpower, the Waffen SS want manpower, yeah, the, the other departments of the SS want manpower, the German army wants replacements and the Luftwaffe are desperate for replacements. Everybody wants manpower. So the, there's a pressure squeeze. So if we go on to the next next one. So what the police do, which many people hadn't realized, was to take young police recruits and put them into the battalions as killers. Now, that's fine to put the young German policemen in their training because to be trained to be policemen is a first step but it keeps them out of the war, so the parents sign up for them to go to be policemen. What they don't know is that their, their boys are being turned into police killers. And if you look at the youth of the, the officer running that operation, you can see just how young these guys are. Some of them are the, not, not much older than 24, 25. And they're committing serious crimes. The problem is, when they're so heavily trained and committed to committing Holocaust-related cri crimes and genocides and destruction of villages, they actually become unfit to be turned into soldiers for, for various reasons. They're just not capable. And so what you actually see is many of the police units, when they're put into combat, they actually just fold up and collapse. They get walked all over and trashed right, left, and center, because they're just not fit for soldiering. And eventually they all get shafted off. 
So if we go on to the next one. So we've now come to 1942, round about this time of year. And Hydrix has been assassinated. And what this does is further rejuvenates the death cult. But now it's been radicalized. Now we're going way, way over the top because Winston Churchill and the plutocrats in the West have deigned to kill our men. Stalin is still in the war. Yugoslavia with Tito is still in the war. And people are dead to come and attack our men. And they're now bombing our cities. And they're dropping a thousand bomb, uh, a thousand bomber raids on Cologne and other places. And it just so happened that when Hydrix died, or thereabouts, the thousand bomber raid on Cologne took place, and it these these um, two incidents become a major football for radicalizing uh, to be kicked around in the various different SS departments as to who's going to take the lead in this stuff. And what you see develop is the concepts of Van der You see a great workup in the extermination camps. I saw it recently when I was finishing off the book for the, the Polish area, which I've examined in close detail, uh, how they ramped up the, the, the killing of Polish Jews, even in the home areas, even in the home in what they call the, the Heimat Kriegsgebiet, which is actually using training soldiers in training to kill Jews and to get the SS to clear the ghettos, as in Bialystok, get the Jews into places like Treblinka and Auschwitz, and they set time limits. You know, Hitler, Hitler says to Goering on, in um, July 1942, we want this done by December 42. So... All of this is happening, the, the aggressive security operations, revenge, retaliation, the infamous destruction of Lidici, while Hitler has decided, hey, we're going to open up a new offensive. So you've got, so again, you've got the, the, the German armies going towards Stalingrad and the SS are going towards mass murder, industrial genocide, holocaust, creation of wastelands and massive destruction process and, and mass killing. And now we really are close to wobbling. So we look at the, the Waffen SS divisions, and this is only 1942. Um, and I've used here John Keegan's famous term, the, the asphalt soldiers, which got kind of forgotten in the historiography, but I think is important because really they are asphalt soldiers. And I agree with that more than the idea that somehow they were special political soldiers. And he identified that they were law unto themselves and that him as soldiers were not like other soldiers and that they had uh, opted for a different philosophy and war. But what he couldn't see, which I can, was if you, if, you know, if you'd focused on that rapid expansion red line, that, that is a warning. Suddenly, in the space of a year, all of those units, I mean, okay, you can see the lines. So that's the Leibstandard to the Das Reich, the Totenkopf, the Polizei, have suddenly all blossomed into divisions. And there's nobody running an inspectorate except for the Panzertruppen inspectorate or the infantry inspectorate of the Wehrmacht that's taking in numbers and returns. There's no longer a great inspectorate and, and Carl Wolf running around trying to see what these troops are doing because there's just too much expansion. It's impossible to, re, to keep an eye on what these people are doing and how they're expanding. Efficiency then becomes a question of whether you've killed enough people, you've raised enough people, but there's no management science between, and, and I'll come back to that later. So we move on to the next slide. Um, what you do see emerge after um, Hydrix, they, these guys have been around all the time. So to, to think that they've, they've only just emerged, they actually come out in, in, in 42 more prominently, but they've been around since the Anschluss, and if not before the Anschluss with Austria in the 30s. Now, these four guys are well known. Odilo Globchotnik is um, the face square to us, as Otto Skorzeny up in the top right, um, there's Kaltenbrunner with his fencing scars, 
who replaces Reinhard Heydrichs below him. And then, of course, Adolf Eichmann with that sneering features. Um, we all learn about later in, in Israel in, in the 1960s when he's put on trial and executed. Now, don't propose to go into a lot of detail here, but they have brought in a new, how can you put it, beyond radicalization now. I think one of the words you used was fanaticism. We're getting close to fanaticism, but from an institutional form. So what we're looking at here is guys who see themselves as supermen who are professionals at killing. And what you actually, what is often forgotten from the history, uh, and it happens now, Scorzani's troops are largely made up of murderers and rapists who have been found guilty by the SS courts. Now imagine, the SS courts have actually found people guilty of murder and sex crimes, which in itself appear, it appears to be a strange phenomenon, yeah? But they're actually given a second chance and Scorzani leads them on, on um, crazy missions. Odilo Gobchotnik, he's gone into the, the camps in the east, what's called the, the Reinhardt camps, like Treblinka and Sobibor and, and Belchek and Kelno. And he's discovered they're inefficient. They're not working well. So he brings a business efficiency, if you like, an industrial efficiency, throws out the old guard and brings in guys who know how to do stuff. So he brings in, for example, Franz Stangl at Treblinka to run the camp process and speeds up the, the development. So they, so I think between um, July 1942 and September 1940, 43, I think it was, don't, don't take me to my word, but about 750,000 people are killed in that period of time, which is an extraordinary amount of killing. Yeah. So I will point to Christopher Hale's book, Deception, which is how people like Eichmann uh, deceived the Hungarian Jews into the camps in Auschwitz and what have you. It's an excellent work and it's quite recent. And also Christopher's in... Twitter. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so I suppose this is me really because this was my research under Richard and, and the book that eventually I published. And I'm just going to put in a, cap, in, a, in a capsule just a small, quick contextualization of, of how things develop by just using Baxalevsi bag. Zalewski as an example. Now, if you'd have been an academic back in the 60s and 70s, you would have seen him only as an SS leader. I'm looking at the, the list on the left-hand side of my screen. I don't know what it's like at yours, but he's a failed Juncker. He's greatly influenced by Hitler. He's an SS police general, and he's deeply involved in the Holocaust. Now, when I examined Baxalevsky's papers, I discovered that there was a deep colonial shame. And if you look at the officer to the left, to the top there, that's his uncle. And he is the Zalewski, who is the equivalent of the Custer. He dies in the colonies. He is killed in the colonies during a raid, a raid which is completely botched, as bad as Custer's little bighorn. And he dies in ignominy, to the point that the Zalewski family continually try to change their name because he's so embarrassing. Now, you might think that that's not important for a young German who becomes a volunteer in the First World War at the age of 15. Well, I suddenly found when I went through Baxalewski's papers that he's writing the two white papers at the top there after his uncle to Himmler about his uncle and about the grave and how he wants to change that story, change his name and be a great hero for the German people. So you you see there's I know it, I know it's very brief, but if you look at the, the second the second to the right from the officer in the black uniform on the top screen, not not my book, but the set those two, yes. You can actually see he actually sent these cuttings to Himmler to say, I 
don't want that record anymore in my life. He also, to show Himmler what a great person he was, he actually sent a, this copy of a book, which is by von Bülow from the First World War, about his regiment's performance in which he's mentioned as a young officer. Okay. So Baxilevsky's whole mindset is geared up to eliminating the shame of his uncle. So the Great War, he's, he, he's into glory. He's a reputation seeker. But what none of his records show is that in 1919, when he was on military duty in Poland, uh, during the, the um, referendums between the, the, the communities, whether they you know, separate territory off after the mandate of the Treaty of Versailles, an old Polish woman throws boiling hot water over him. So he gets his troops to kick her to death in front of him. Now, that came into a record from a Polish source which was not in his military record at all. Now, whether they, whether him, I suspect Himmler would have known because that, that kind of behavior circulated round and round and round and they all knew who was doing what. But he was well known for this behavior because in 1934, when Himmler and Goering are killing Rome, Baxilevsky goes off and kills his rival. So he takes over his, his, his territory in, in the East. Um, and that's sanctioned because under going back to that ideological curve under Nazi social Darwinism if you think your other man is incompetent and you can kill him and take his job and do a better job go for it and that's what he does so he's not so not only have you got Rome killing at, being killed at the top end you've got rivalries being killed and this is where this dubious nature of institutionalized killing now becomes part of the credo, if you like, of the SS mentality. Now, a lot of people thought that Baxilevsky took drugs and started to regret what he had done when he was killing Jews in 1941. Well, what I actually discovered from his records was he was suffering from a form of impacted hemorrhoids which made his life, di life discomfortable, uncomfortable. So what he did was to ramp up the killing exercises and to, it, to speed up the process, Hermann Goering gave him an aeroplane. So he's flying around the East, killing Jews in large and larger numbers, literally to get the job done so he can then go off to hospital. So he's sustaining his killing process with high doses of morphine and heroin. So by the time he gets into a, into a hospital in, in 1942, he's actually not only addicted to morphine or heroin or whatever, I'm not great on these drugs, um, but he's rambling. And Himmler tells off the doctor saying, no, he's not regretting what he's doing, he's just rambling and once he's off the once he's, once he's off the drugs, he'll back to being our dear old back again. And he'll be a nice guy. And we'll all love him again. He's such a nice person. Well, he's only out for a short period when Hydrix is killed. And at one point, they actually consider making him Hydrix's replacement. Well, frankly, I think they all probably wet themselves and said, no, no. <laughs> we're not having that lunatic running us. And he went to Vanden Bekenfeld, and that's how he got involved with Vanden Bekenfeld. Now, my story in this is, I, while I was doing my research, um, deciding before I met Richard Holmes on what I wanted to do, I went to the Polish Resistance Museum um, Institute, which was then in Gunnersbury in West London. And I went to visit some some of the Polish uh, resistance fighters who'd taken part in the, the Warsaw Uprising in 1944. And, and I just wanted to talk about Warsaw because I'd visited Warsaw both during the, the, the period when uh, Poland was under Soviet, if you like, Soviet occupation, which it pretty much was. I mean, it was a, it was a horrible experience. I went there in 1983, but I went back in 1995 and I, and I became fascinated with 
the two uprisings. So you've got the ghetto uprising and then you've got the 1944 uprising. Now, the ladies at the Polish Resistance Institute gave me that diagram. And if you can see that diagram, it will show you how the SS is thinking. Uh, I guess it's probably not tight enough, but what you would actually see there is he's referring to names. He's referring to specific units. He's not really talking about an organization structure over his head. And that's because there wasn't one. And that is a primary reason why the, the, the matrix model is highly effective in explaining what Baksalevsky is doing. He's running to a matrix. And if you look at the way he runs the four or five areas of the eastern occupation zones, you will see that there's loose controls and that there's communications going hither and thither because it's a learning process. The amount of information that that guy is getting is phenomenal. And the way I found it, because they distributed the records in a rather silly way after the war, was to actually go to his distribution lists. Uh, on the back of every German document, there's always a distribution list. And his distribution lists are the biggest I've ever seen. They're almost two pages of people he's reporting to every time he writes a report. And each one is one line. So there's about 140 organizations that he is issuing reports to across the whole of the German right. So that's the Luftwaffe, the Kriegsmarine, the Army, this, that, and the other. So there's this huge communication process taking place. And as I say, that ended up with me publishing the book Hitler's Bandit Hunters in 2006. But that's the process. And that is why I, you know, I've gone the way I have, because I literally focus, I didn't just focus on Baksalevsky, I focused on the on the three issues. Baksalevsky, Bandit McCampfen, and Warsaw. And and by decompressing them, if you like, breaking them out and looking at their constituent parts, I could see how the SS organization was working. And even to the point that I knew, I learned, and I've got his diary somewhere, um, that the horrors that they were imposing on Warsaw was to make the Russians come into the city so an encirclement could take place with the German units outside. So you've got all these German units all lined up, and the Russians are looking at them saying, yeah, we know what you want, but we ain't doing it. Now, for the Russians, that is serious propaganda. For the Nazis, they've, got the, uh, they've literally got the, the Stalin in their hands, and they're trying to pressure him, and they do it by killing and committing extreme atrocities against the Poles. And of course, the Allies are trying to push Stalin in, and Stalin's saying, you're not reading what I'm looking at. If I go in there, the whole of the Red Army that commits to that is going to be surrounded, and I've got trouble. And half of my army's up there in Bagrad here and have gone north. Another have, have come down into Warsaw, plus there's pressure down in the south. So he he is in a very difficult position. And what Baksalevsky is saying is, the more pressure I put up, the more I see Soviet soldiers crossing the Vistula. But that doesn't come into the history. And I'm not saying that what they did was good, but it's a point. So, what Baksalevsky and Himmler dream up is a rejuvenation of SS traditions and symbolism through the Banda Mikanthon program. So, if you look to the book on the left, 1936, is when Himmler wrote uh, a small pamphlet on the SS as an anti Bolshevik organization, which Really, it's just a propaganda screed. You know, we're all we're all supermen, and we're here to destroy the Jewish Bolshevik threat. But by the time you get to 1942, he's more sophisticated. So he actually puts together a Bandenby Kanfung semi manual, which is going to be the the, the working methodology for Bandenby Kanfung in the field for Baksalevsky to work to, but also for the Wehrmacht to start thinking about. Now, by 1944, 
Baksalevsky wants to give out a medal, well, lo and behold, he digs to the Tula Society, which is one of these strange right-wing organizations that imagined Iceland <coughs> was the home of Atlantis and all of this weird and crazy stuff. But the symbolism of, of Siegfried's sword from Wagner's operas is now reintroduced with the head of the Medusa being cut off because the snakes are the partisans and, and the, that's a killing badge. Yeah? So just when you think you've got away from the SS past, it's being rejuvenated and restored. So the idea that this, this system has gone away hasn't. There's only one purpose for this quote. I put these two, quote, these two parts of this quote together. It's Himmler's pose and speeches in, in October 1943. He announces they've been killing the Jews. And, it's a, and rightly, Holocaust historians and scholars have, have focused on this as a very important moment when the Nazis, and especially Himmler, admit to what they have been doing. And um, Professor Kershaw came up with a with the uh, with the notion that you're burning your bridges when you do this because there's no going back now this isn't rome this is ultra destruction of a large population of europe and nobody's going to forgive you on the allied side so you've got nowhere to go but as a little a little offside which is not really always recognized is what himmler said at the end if the Jews were still part of the German nation, we would most likely arrive now at the state we were at in 1916 or 17. He's going back to his First World War experience. He's going back to the period when Ludendorff said we're losing the war because there was no longer food and resources and everybody was stretched and manpower and all the rest of it. And he's technically saying we won the war. Technically. Not quite. But he's saying the SS has won its mission. That's a very profound comment that he's saying that if we hadn't done this, they would be still part of the German nation, which means they're not part of the German nation. We're not going to go down the collapse of 1916, 17 again, and we're going to win the war. So next one. So. If you were a businessman, this is absolutely, absolutely, spellbinding, spellbinding, spellbinding. Ab ab absolutely amazing. Just uh, fantastic. We're, we're all spellbound. Okay. Well, we're nearly at the end. There's a few <laughs> Sorry about this. Anyway, if you were to do a strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats analysis of the situation of the SS in April, so forget the Bagration. That's not happened. They're not in D-Day. The structural wobbly. And the reason why there's structural wobbling is if you take out the strengths and the opportunities, you know, you're still in the war, you're holding the line, you can rejuvenate, radicalize and restore. You take those out. The weaknesses are this is your last manpower. So you are exposed to attrition. This is not the time to play attrition war. And certainly you don't stand toe to toe with the allies because you are not going to win. You have to fight a different battle. The German Wehrmacht know that, but it's not so certain that the SS understand that because militarily they're not that sophisticated. So institutional integrity and loss of cohesion, that's a major threat because the SS has always been this tight, functioning, high level, hitting the targets, bang, bang, bang. And now you're actually mentioning the breakdown of loss of co cohesion and institutional integrity, that's actually breaking the Prussian military code. You're actually doing what the German military culture doesn't want you to do. <laughs> this is like, no, you don't do this. This, no, you just, you've got to save the organization. Otherwise, the whole thing's been a waste, which is why the German army comes out of the First World War pretty solid. Yeah. It hasn't won the war, but technically, did it lose? No, it kept its integrity and it's kept its cohesion. So if we go on to the next slide, 
this is how I, this is me now. This is me indulging myself. We have got to the YouTube effect. So if you look at the, the fantastic engine on the left, that's going to run brilliantly. And off it goes. But a YouTube effect is when, if you've ever tried it, if you press a finger down the left side, the water comes up the right side, but then it goes back down to where it was again. And if you do it on the right side, it goes up on the left side, and then the water comes back down together. It stays in that same center. So it doesn't matter how radical you are, how aggressive you are, it doesn't matter how much water and chaos and whatever you do, the water will always go, the fluid will always go back to that same point. And that is where the SS had achieved them. In their actions and operations over this long period of expansion and everything else that they've been doing, they've actually achieved the YouTube effect. They can't do much. Whatever they do is never going to give them what they require, which is the great success. So this is the point when they've failed. So if we go on, the next one. So as you can see, the old guard are congratulated, given old medals, salutes, and all the rest of it. And then Himmler has to go into the youth again. So they start mining the uh, Adolf Hitler schools for the primary candidates. Many of those end up in the 12th SS Panzer Division. Plus, they start weeding out more and more labor from industry and forestry and railways and everything else. At the same time, guess what? They expand their activities and if we go to the next slide, we get to Hitler's Fire Brigade, which has been already going on for a short while in 42 and 43, but now 44, they're putting out fires everywhere because, well, Hitler's policies have failed. So you've actually now, <laughs> and that, this sounds quite upside down, you're actually putting out the fires that Hitler's policies created which you weren't supposed to have happened in the first place because you're the SS. And I know, <laughs> I saw your face, Woody, there, and I yeah. thought, yeah. But you're in a crazy logic because you've got Warsaw, you've got Slovakia, you've got home Budapest, <laughs> Budapest. And so in the same time that you're sending troops to all of those places, Adolf Eichmann is shifting a million Jews from Hungary to go to camps Plus, they're closing other camps to move people around from place to place. So you've got this mad chaos. I mean, you they, the SS are really putting the strains now on the whole German system, and they are now wobbling the state. They're not only wobbling themselves, they're wobbling the nation. So if we go on. So what you actually see with the soldiers down on the ground is increasing incompetence. Uh I mean, I, in the past, I've always discussed Kurt Meyer, how before he takes over, before he's given the, the 12th SS Panzer Division, he's on a Panzer Grenadier Regiment course. So by the time he's in command of the 12th SS Panzer Division, he's actually had no official staff training to run a Panzer Division. Okay. And, you know, I put, I put up some thoughts on this. I mean, the guy like him or Lamadine and all the others, they commit they commit to crimes because they've actually got to a point they don't know much else to do. So you ask yourself, why is this SS Panzer Division coming up these roads in France and spending all of its time destroying these villages when it's supposed to be prioritizing getting to Normandy? I mean, Orador is a day. Well, how far could those units have got if they hadn't have sat around doing that stuff. And if you look at what uh, the killings at Chateau Audrey, they've not only killed how many it was, I think 27 men, but they actually individually took them round the garden and shot them in separate places. So there's an, and there's, there's an element of sadism there in the killing. This isn't war crimes as you would expect war crimes to be. This is war crimes before even military necessity. It's just, uh, why? What's the point? Why are you doing this? So we're going to the next one. So the period June and September is the destruction time. And, you know, 
this causes immense demotivation within the Waffen SS because you know Meyer's caught in a barn by the Belgian resistance. Wittmann is killed in his tank, and Fritz Witt is destroyed by naval shell fire. Now the question is, <laughs> you could have asked the question. Why is Fritz Witt in a position where he's being destroyed by naval gunfire? I mean, to me, that is just, that is crazy. And then between Meyer and Wittmann, I still argue that, that forget all this, the Allies killed Wittmann. I think Meyer did it because he made Wittmann go and stand in an exposed point because he doesn't understand how tanks work. Wittmann, because he's running to his commander, following orders blindly because that's what he does goes to a position exposes himself and gets smacked and then Meyer runs away in a German army <laughs> in a German army uniform leaving behind a division which has gone from 21,000 young men to 1500 and maybe a tank I mean you've got to ask what are these guys doing and how how do they justify those results to Hitler well you know we died brilliantly for you, Führer. Yeah, well, okay, here's another Knight's Cross. Well done. Keep dying. <laughs> the more you die, the more crosses, Knight's Crosses you're going to get. Brilliant. You know, what a business that is. And they do. They keep on giving out Knight's Crosses. So if you go to the next slide, we're coming up to the end. So we've got desperation, mediocrity, uh, the end. And I've put these three guys together because, you know, we are really seeing the height of incompetence now. You've got Piper, who, you know, he's a hypochondriac. He has issues with his nervous breakdowns and, and all the rest of it going on. And, you know, he's, in some cases, I, I think maybe he's living in a fantasy world. Then you've got Leon de Grel, who's pushing this Valonian argument within the SS and that he wants to take over from from Rudel. Rudel is Hitler's favorite Stuka pilot. Well, de Grel wants to be Hitler's adopted son. And he's living in some fantasy world. And then somewhere along the line, <laughs> in all this craziness, someone gives Himmler a job as a field hare, you know, to actually run an army in the field. And he takes control of army group Vistula, which my goodness, <laughs> who would do that? Yeah, because the whole system now is so crazy. They make those kind of wild decisions, and and now we're in this this area. I mean, okay, people have called it the bitter end, and but really, this is in a sense, it's what the SS have always wanted: war for war's sake. But once they're in there, they don't want to do it anymore. Himmler runs off to the the clinic because he suffers from headaches. Piper wants to save himself in the war. De Grel's quick on his aeroplane. And most of those old boys like Gottlob Berger, Hans Jutner, they all survived the war and they're very quick to get into an allied camp and say, hey, Himmler was trying to do this, I'm trying to do that. But really I'm the I'm I'm a good guy. Himmler's the nasty guy. And then of course if we go to the last slide, um we've got to the point where the machine is now eating itself and and you've got overreach there's failure to administer rapid growth uh failure to internalize military training and experience because you don't have the time there's over dependency on trusted people to overperform. so piper has i mean who would have given piper the the idea that he's going to lead the the front of the ardennes to to make this great breakthrough i mean who would who would give him that job I mean, why and then the sheer waste of good manpower is criminal for me the ss wastes all those ncos who are probably some of germany's best fighting soldiers those ncos not so much the officers i the officers here and there but the the profoundly well-trained in the Wehrmacht SS NCOs that come and fight and fill up the ranks of the regiments in 1940-41, they're excellent soldiers and they get wasted. And there's very few of them left at the end. 
And what you also get is this madness of heightened killing. You know, I've spoken to psychiatrists on this who've looked at SS men and examined them in the past. And, you know, the heightened bloodlust, it just breaks your combat efficiency because you're not thinking anymore. You're just acting in a most irrational way. And killing them becomes the, the primary motive. And, and that that's undermining military efficiency all along. When... When Montgomery, I think, said you, you don't do revenge and retaliation, work, he, he's quite right, because you lose the troops. And this has been institutionalized, and you're losing because the troops don't know how to properly fight like the German army. The other thing with the Waffen-SS is the material overload and the squandered assets. I mean, they are a pampered elite. I mean, they move around with all this gear, and they trash it. Well, the German army is rationed. They make a tank work. And um, when I say work, they really do take out enemy tanks. They use the equipment as it should be used, as, a mil as militarily efficient and with high levels of efficiency. The SS don't. And you can see that in the numerical returns. There's a lack of control. Like I said before, the internal and the external controls have all melted. And to a certain extent, and I, I seriously believe this now, it's un, the SS have come from being at the heart of Hitler's thinking to unhitch from the war plan. And if Hitler did have a plan, and I'm not sure he did, uh, they are unhitched from that too. So they are now completely on their own, running their own, well, I suppose they're running their own war, really. And... The evidence that I've used to come up with ideas like this is that body counts as performance culture. You know, I've taken two sets of figures here. One is the killings from 1941 in, I think, Lithuania by an Einsatz group. And as you can see, it's just lists of numbers. On, on the other one, the brown set of figures, that's Das Reich uh, Panzer Division returns to the Panzer Truppen Inspectorate. And that is showing the, the shortfalls in tanks and equipment because the division has been in the east for so long, it's, it's getting pretty much trashed. And, it, and by the time it goes to France in February 44, it's going to be in terrible condition, which is another reason why it behaves the way it does, because it's actually an incoherent organization by that stage. It's, it's been in battle for so long. They're probably all crazy. They're all probably just utterly crazy. And they're going to be given new missions and new missions and new missions. So the craziness becomes internalized and they just become even more mad for killing and destruction. So if you want to go to the last slide. Uh, oh, no, second. Uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of out of sync now. Um, what you're actually getting here with the SS is... Um, if you're looking at it from the bigger picture, the culture at the strategic level and in the, at the cultural level have completely collapsed. So the body count becomes a musician. As a, imagine, body count is a strategic mission. Have you ever heard of anything so ridiculous? Then having taken the numbers as an absence of scientific management analysis, so nobody's learning from anything that's going on with all of the killing, apart from the fact that they're killing. So they drift from a learning organization into this wobbly collection of amassing more and more information about less and less. And they're locked in their own culture to a point where they've actually created a jail for themselves with their ideology and their structural chaos. And as I've said at the end there, they're in matrix overload. Now down at the operational level, where you think somebody might have an idea what's going on, there's no management evaluation. If you read Dietrich's rewards for Knight's Cross to people like Meyer and Piper and all of these people, it is utter rubbish. Oh, he did this. And, he did. and you just know it's all a load of old nonsense. There's no me leadership measurement. So having been this organization that knows how to lead and be a leader and set the culture of leadership as the stormtroopers, the front campers, the outer camper, and all of this 
great Nazi stuff. They've now got nothing. Nobody knows who or what is going on. And as I say, there's no strategic plan filtering down at the operational level. So what you end up with doing is you're killing, killing, and more killing. And to sustain the level of killing and the, and the mayhem that's going on in your operational activities, you're trying to raise recruitment, you're enforcing people to join your ranks, and you're actually press-ganging foreigners to come into your colours to fight for your units, and then wondering why the people run away afterwards. Well, ugh, you know, we are really in a strange place at this point. So if we go to the next one, you know, there's the final act. It, it ends in death because it kicked off in death. Not in the idea that, you know, Himmler wasn't born to the idea of death. He's a, just a, he's a middle-class lost boy at the end of the First World War whose all of his ambitions have been trashed. But he decides that there's going to be this death cult process which he, he builds into the ethos of the SS. And, of course, it ends there. Um, he takes poison and... Masses of SS soldiers die in Berlin, and it's hard to find anybody who can say can justify to me why those SS soldiers are dying in Berlin in in April 1945, and for what purpose? Hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, absolutely well, Phil. I mean, we've. We've all been sitting here discussing in the sidebar. Just this has been absolutely spellbinding. I feel I've I've been. It would be like watching Johan Cruyff's debut in 19 whatever years. But it's I'm absolutely amazing, Phil. This is this you've turned my thinking on its head. People thought this is just spellbinding. David O'Keefe saying every fanboy SS guy should watch this show. Just the, the comparisons to business. It just just yeah. I, I'm I'm gonna have to take a while to decompress and consider all the things you've talked about. I think everyone else watching as well is gonna be in exactly the same position. A very very important show this was tonight. I can see it being being looked back by people in, in years to come. Absolutely privileged to listen to you, Phil. Really amazing. Well, that's very kind of you. Um, I mean, what do you want to do? Are we done? or do you want Yeah, well, well, I think, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I think we'll bring things to an end because, yeah, it's been nearly two hours and, I mean, absolutely amazing. So I'll just speak to, to the viewers and I'll come back and say hello to you in a second, Phil. But um, so, well, that was fantastic, uh, folks. Tomorrow night we have John Nelson Rickard coming on talking about Guy Simmons. So the Canadian commander, and normally that will be interesting. And then we've got Patton on uh, Saturday, so a couple more shows going. But, yeah, absolutely spellbinding. Um, I think it's a it's a fair a foregone conclusion that we're going to get Phil back in the future to, to expand on this or talk about something specific or focus on one aspect of the leadership. I don't know. That was just we, – we'll, we'll do that. But, but as for now, I think we need to have a break uh, because that's just – these are decompressory. But so, Phil, just my sincere – Thank you, and for doing that, that was absolutely amazing. And um, yeah, well, don't forget, everybody, check out Dr. Phil on on Twitter. Check out his books. Check out he's got a book coming out in September. This is part of the the next but one book, isn't it? This work. This is the next but one book. Yeah. So um, yeah, you, you've you've been in the presence of greatness, you viewers tonight. This has been absolutely amazing. So well, thank you very much, everybody. I will see you all again tomorrow night. Phil, that was just, I'm going to say it again, absolutely outstanding. Don't forget, check us all out on Patreon. Check Phil out on Twitter. Check me out on Twitter. Tell your friends about what we're doing here on World War II TV because I feel we're, we are um, breaking some new ground with, with the depth of, um, of, of insight we're giving into some of these subjects. And I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that people like Phil and, and Peter Caddick, Adams on Monday, and Ollie Yesti, the range of people we're having on talking about this stuff. Your talk, your your theory about Warsaw, I think, has blown people's minds, Phil. That's that, that's going to – yeah, absolutely amazing. I and there's not enough superlatives left. So, um, yeah, brilliant. Um, I'm going to end the stream now. Do you, enjoy, do, do you enjoy it, Phil, despite the heat? Thank you very much. I no, really no. enjoyed it because it's been a long time and I've been able to express these kind of things. So thank you very much, actually, and thank you guys for listening, everybody. No, thank you, everybody. So I will see you all again tonight, tomorrow night, folks. This is Paul Wadge for World War II TV saying have a good evening.